Hi everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about The Bone Clocks by David Mitchell, Rebecca by Dumouriez, Ice by Anna Kavan, and Night's Master by Tan Flea. The Bone Clocks by David Mitchell is a mind-bending literary fiction slash fantasy, though there is a joke in the book that saying a book is half fantasy is like saying a woman is half pregnant. But this book spans a time period of 59 plus years and follows five perspectives in different decades. We start out in this book following Holly Sykes in 1984, a 15-year-old character who runs away from home, and this ends up having major consequences not only for her family, but for the future lives of a Cambridge scholar, a war reporter who goes to Iraq and comes home, and also a writer and another life as well. But it's all combined with this interesting, mind-bending fantasy magic that you don't really have context for when you start the book but comes out, it comes together, it's all explained towards the end of the book. And if there's one flaw with this book, it's that all that explanation happens really fast, all at once, and then there's a lot of rising action and resolution that happens within a few pages. So I felt like that part was a bit rushed, but that's not to take away from the magnificence of the rest of the book because I found this book incredibly powerful, incredibly emotional for me. It made me laugh at times. It made me cry. I had to put the book down because my eyes got so blurry and it's very rich in character work. If you enjoy slice of life narratives, then I would highly recommend this book um, because that's essentially what it's doing. I think that each of the characters in the different time periods is a perfect reflection of the location in which they're born, the culture at the time, their socioeconomic status, their gender, all those different things are, are brought forth to, to make up these characters. But at the same time, I feel like they're individuals in their own right. Each of them has a revelation or ends up having to shift in some way. And so I found the character work extremely rich in this book. It's a book I'm still thinking about. It's a book that makes you realize the ripple effects of one person's life having greater effects on the whole of humanity or of other people, that none of us live in a vacuum, so to speak. So I loved this book. I'm still thinking about it. I picked it up thanks to Jimmy from the Fantasy Network, and I ended up buddy reading this with Fantasy Awash. We had a wonderful discussion on her channel with Jimmy, and that particular discussion was meaningful to me because it's one thing to talk about this book in a spoiler-free way, it was Jimmy's, one of Jimmy's favorite books of 2023, I should go ahead and mention. But this book is worthy of discussion. It's the kind of book that you want to talk about, that you want to unpack, and you have to go into spoilers to do that. Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. Next book is Rebecca by Du Maurier. I buddy read this with Andrew from Andrew's Wizardly Reads, and we had such a fun time. We read two chapters a day, had wonderful conversations. We both had predictions. They were both right, but then there were there was more story that unfolded after that. There were some things that both of us did not expect. And this book is told in first person narration from a nameless narrator, so we never get her name. She's of not such a high social status, I guess, or class. She ends up the companion in training to a woman who is of a higher social status when she meets Maxim de Manderley who is the widower of the Manderley estate. She ends up falling in love with him or becoming highly infatuated with him right away. He ends up proposing to her with a very interesting proposal, I'll say. Um, so she ends up becoming the bride of Manderley, this big noble estate that is magnificent. But all the while, she is haunted by the memory of Maxim's wife that is deceased, Rebecca. So she's constantly comparing herself to Rebecca. I've never read a book where a deceased figure looms as large as Rebecca does in this story. She feels like she's there in a way, and you almost feel as though the, the walls of the house are judging this character because she has such an inferiority complex. She is a very shy character, she's artistic, and she spends a lot of time ruminating in her mind or imagining in her mind what Rebecca was like what Rebecca was like with her husband, Maxim, what life was like here, or what people think of her there. I mean, she's constantly in these imaginative musings. And I think that was one of the things I found so compelling about this story, in addition to the incredible rich setting of the Manderley estate, 
was that this character has such a complex that you can't help but wonder how reliable she is as a narrator and whether her projections of herself and the way she thinks other people see her, how reliable those things are compared to the truth of how she is, how other people truly perceive her. And I feel like this adds to the tension in the story because there are some really tense things that happen in the book. I immediately felt captured by this story. It has a very famous first line, last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. And I have to say that that first chapter has to be one of my favorite first chapters I've ever read. I went ahead and looked up a little bit about Gothic literature because I was curious and I watched this wonderful video I'll link below by Tristan in the Classics. He did a wonderful video called Eight Aspects of Gothic Literature, something along those lines. But he talked about the aspects of Gothic literature and one being the setting, especially being set in a castle or large house. And you feel that in the Manderley estate that the house is so symbolic. It's almost like a character in and of itself. And nature, the gardens, the flowers, it, nature has almost like a, a sinister quality to it, almost an antagonistic quality to it at the same time as being very beautiful. So it plays with a really interesting juxtaposition as far as that's concerned. And it also has that aspect of memory of the past of Rebecca looming large as a presence, as a central figure in the story. There are so many other things that he said in that video that made me think this is the perfect gothic book, basically. I'm really glad I got to this and that I buddy read it with Andrew. Had a wonderful time with Rebecca. I now understand why so many of you love this book. I did look up the trailer, the Netflix trailer for the adaptation of this book, and it looked very sexy, and I wouldn't consider this a sexy book, so I was a little puzzled by that and still kind of curious. Not saying that adaptations can't adapt for a modern audience, but it's just not the way that I saw this story. So if you watch that adaptation, please let me know your thoughts. I'd still be open-minded to checking it out someday. Ice by Anna Kavan is an apocalyptic story where ice is taking over the world. These walls of ice are closing in and it's causing um, war and anarchy and chaos. And meanwhile, we have another nameless protagonist, another nameless narrator. It's told in first person narration. And I did a video recently about love triangles and adult fantasy and how I think they could be successful. There is not exactly what I would call a love triangle, but there's a triangle of sorts in this particular book with our nameless protagonist as he finds this woman, this albino looking woman in the ice, in the snow. He ends up essentially saving her at the beginning, according to his version of the story. And then she ends up entrapped in this abusive relationship with the man who's called the warden. So these three figures, they're never actually named in the story, but they are the three main characters in the story. But the story is very dreamlike. It's very strange in that the character is constantly searching for the girl, finding the girl, and then the warden comes in and then either he leaves or she leaves. And then the cycle kind of repeats itself. So there's a subtle repetition that happens throughout the story with this dynamic of finding and losing and finding again and things recurring. But at the same time, there's also a subtle variation taking place. It's a bit of a traveling narrative, but again, very dreamlike. And while I wouldn't say this is a very plot driven story in a traditional sense, I do think it comes together. It makes sense. I couldn't help but make comparisons between ice and Blood Meridian by McCarthy. It's really interesting to look at these two books side by side because Blood Meridian is, it's very masculine. There is a ton of violence. There's also a recurrent figure, the judge, an evil figure, if you will, kind of like the warden in Ice. But whereas Blood Meridian is in a Western setting, in a historical period, Ice, I don't know if Ice is supposed to be futuristic or not, but it's also a traveling narrative. I feel like there's some interesting parallels and contrasts between the two books, but they're just interesting to look side by side in that regard. I would say Ice almost felt to me like a feminist blood meridian in a way. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get in trouble for saying that, but they are dealing with different things. Ice, as it says here on the back, the ice itself, those ice walls closing in, they, they are described as an allegory for the author's struggles with addiction. 
The author is noted for having had um, issues with heroin abuse, um, with heroin addiction, and also being in and out of psychiatric wards. At one point, she dyed her hair or bleached her hair white to resemble this character, this ice girl in here, or this glass girl, I should say. But actually, I think ice is a very apt metaphor for trauma because as these ice walls are coming in, it has a violent antagonistic quality, but at the same time, the narrator also describes the, the ice as being a silencing factor, as being something that could cause silence and peace that is threatening. And so almost like a death quality, but at the same time, it's dynamic. It's coming in and out of the story. And I feel like that's that's perfect to describe trauma because what does trauma do? It repeats cycles and it keeps you frozen in time. It keeps you frozen in a sense of being a victim, but it also repeats a cycle of violence as well. So I feel like the ice metaphor was profound in this book and I got a lot out of it because of that. It was very disturbing. I had bad dreams when I read this book, I will not lie, but I found it incredibly compelling. I loved Gavon's writing style. It was stunning at times, and at the same time, it had a very direct momentum that propelled you forward in the book. I think it's worth reading if you're interested in that exploration. Very atmospheric and very disturbing. Lastly, Night's Master by Tanith Lee. This is book one from Tales from the Flat Earth. If I understand correctly, each of these tales from the flat earth deal with a different part of this realm, of this flat earth realm. And so in this particular book, we're dealing with the earth plane and the demonic realm. And the story starts out with Osron abducting a human child, a human baby, bringing this child to the hell realm and raising the child, loving the child, bonding with the child, which is kind of creepy the way that occurs, by the way. And then bringing the child for amusement up to earth where he finds his amusement. He finds his amusement in human destruction and suffering as humanity is prone to do, yet he can't be, can't be in sunlight. But his child, this human, starts to long for the sun, wants to know what that's all about. And this ends up leading to a series of events fueled by that desire. So this feels very saga-like in that one story bleeds into another story, into another story. So it feels almost like this tapestry of short story, but Osron, the demon prince, is the central figure in the story. He's in and out of the book, in and out of the stories, but it really is his full story. It really does come full circle to him learning about his conflict with loving humanity for its amusement to him. Again, finding amusement in influencing destruction and horror on the planet but also what happens when it goes too far? What happens when humans destruct themselves and it goes too far, if that's your main form of amusement? But another thing we're exploring is beauty and ugliness, which is something that Lee seems to enjoy exploring, as I noticed when I read her book, Electric Forest, last year, which I should go ahead and mention, I buddy read both Electric Forest and this book with Whitney from Secret Sauce of Storycraft, and we couldn't help but notice that because in Electric Forest, you have a main protagonist who is disfigured and who's treated terribly by a society where people are genetically engineered to be beautiful. And she ends up being isolated and angry as a result of that, or very suspicious of people when a man approaches her and says, I can make you beautiful, and seeing how that transformation might change her. In this particular book, you have characters who are disfigured and they might not start out feeling ill-tempered, but then when society treats them poorly, they become vengeful, they become scornful. So it's not so much a commentary that disfigurement makes somebody bad, but that disfigurement and society treating disfigured people poorly might cause these difficult emotions to emerge or conflicts to emerge. It's also about that incongruous relationship between inner beauty and outer beauty in the sense that we also have this demon, Azran, who is described as sexually irresistible and everything in the demon realm is described with this exotic beauty. There are, I think, like black marble pillars and fountains of fire and fish that fly. It's surreal, but it's also described with this glamorous quality to it. And I would say that this book, kind of like the book I talked about previously, the characters are fairly flat. They're not super fleshed out. But I still found it incredibly compelling and 
I think part of that has to do with Lee's writing style. Now, last year I read Last Tale of the Flower Bride, and that particular book was published in 2023, and it's a modern, dark fairy tale story that does have more of a traditional plot and has more three-dimensional characters with backstories. So this book does not have that going for it, but Lee's writing style worked for me more than Last Tale of the Flower Bride. I found the writing style in that book felt a little contrived for me, whereas Lee's metaphors felt convincing to me. They were beautiful. There was an ethereal quality to them. And I liked seeing the range between her writing style in this book, a fantasy book, and, and Electric Forest, a sci-fi book. So I loved Lee's writing style. It worked for me. It was just so rich and atmospheric. And at the same time, the story moves. It moves. There's a lot that happens. But I feel like everything is in service to that um, showing the darker aspects of humanity, the the demon lord's influence on humanity, and his story arc overall. So I thought it all worked in a very clever way. And I also appreciated that in Gregory Sadler's video, which I watched, which was a lecture on Tanith Lee's Tales from the Flat Earth, I'll link that video down below, he talked about interviews with Lee and how she didn't want to put her books in a box, how she felt pressure even at that time from publishers to make her stories fit into a certain genre box. And for her, she didn't even like to distinguish between her stories being for a younger audience, for YA versus adult, except in terms of how much sexual content was in the book and how much violence. But I think I think her writing is exceptional. There are some content warnings, by the way, so please check those out if you need to. I enjoyed Electric Forest more than this book, but I did enjoy this book. So that is it for now. Please let me know if you've read these books or if you're planning to read these books. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.